What's up? What's happening? Welcome here to Lacrosse Now. I'm Travis Eldridge. Great show here on tap once again this week. We've got two guests. We've got the reigning midfielder of the year in the country in NCAA men's lacrosse, Sam Hanley from Penn. Here, what he's been up to this fall. He's actually not been on campus back in Philadelphia. He's been out in Oregon taking this semester off before he returns for his final semester there at Penn. Here, what he's been up to, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about this year ahead for the Quakers. Plus, our watch party replay interview this week is with Drexel goalie Ross Blumenthal, who has a terrific memory, first of all, and has some terrific stories, including you're going to love the story he tells about what he was feeling like heading into his first ever CAA semifinal playoff game in goal for Drexel. It was his freshman year a couple of years ago back in 2019. Tells a great story about how nervous he was for that opportunity. So those interviews are coming up. But we're going to kick things off with the much-anticipated release of my top 10 NCAA men's teams here in the fall. So this is coming out of fall ball. Just about everybody is done now. So we're going to give you my way-too-early still top 10. We'll, we'll get the preseason uh, rankings coming up here in January. But this is just what I'm feeling right now, some of the things I've heard and read about some of these teams here in fall ball so far and how I'm feeling about some of these rosters entering this 2023 spring. Obviously, a lot can change with injuries. Some roster movement still could happen here in the next couple of months. But this is, as of now, my top 10 teams entering 2023. I'm going to start with a couple of honorable mentions, though. So here are a, a trio of teams that... For me, were close. They were in the mix. I had them, a couple of these teams at one point or another, in my top ten. I ended up moving them out. The three teams I like, Harvard, they've got a bunch coming back from a team last year that, I mean, talk about how they kind of just played their way right into the national spotlight under head coach Jerry Byrne. Love what they did last year. Obviously made the NCAA tournament. I really like what they have coming back. Rutgers, a team that made championship weekend last year. Uh, an amazing story. Scarlet Knights championship weekend for the first time ever. They've got Ross Scott back, but they lost a lot in terms of all those transfers that they had brought in before. Kind of a reloading type of situation for Rutgers. But unlike some of these other teams, we haven't seen Rutgers consistently reload with these kinds of rosters. So I'm going to be in a wait and see mode for Rutgers. But I have them right there on the edge of the top 10. And same goes for another Big Ten team in Ohio State. Now, love Jack Myers. The same aspect I like, really like Ross Scott for Rutgers. Jack Myers took a huge step forward and I think can continue to take steps forward for uh, head coach Nick Myers and company there for the Buckeyes. Also really like the fact that they have uh, Skylar uh, Whalen back in goal. And keep an eye on, on midfielder Artie Allen. I saw him play in high school at IMG Academy. He was actually a football recruit at IMG Academy, and anybody who knows IMG Academy football knows that is a some of the best players in the country come out of there. And he was competing with some of them on the football field, so a tremendous athlete in the midfield for Ohio State. Keep an eye on him still early in his Buckeyes career. So those are my honorable mentions. Oh, by the way, Ohio State also opens a brand-new lacrosse-specific stadium out there in Columbus. I, I hope at some point I can get a look at that here in the next year or so, but it looks spectacular. They're going to be playing home games there this spring, so that is a upgrade and a bonus for Ohio State as well. But have them just on the outside of the top 10. So let's get to my top 10 here. At number 10, how about the Delaware Blue Hens? Maybe a surprise to some, but not when you know what they have coming back. First off, this was one of the top eight teams at the end of the year. They, they made the quarterfinals knocking off a Georgetown team that everybody thought was great. And they went to Georgetown and beat them and did so in like a convincing fashion. It wasn't a fluke. They beat Georgetown and they played them tough, physical. So they have proven that they can do it. And think about what they have coming back. They lose one starter, essentially, from last year's team. And, and that... Um, is, uh, is Mark Bita, but you return your entire starting attack unit that totaled more than 200 combined points a year ago, and Mike Robinson, J.P. Ward, and Ty Kurtz. And remember, that was really J.P. Ward's first year kind of stepping into that quarterbacking role on that offense. Of course, it was Charlie Kitchen prior to him who was the quarterback of the offense along with Robinson and Kurtz. Ward proved that he could step in and excel, and I think he can even, even make another step forward this year. If he does that, look out. That offense is going to be really good 
Also love the midfield depth. Not only do you have a great first line midfield for Delaware, but you've got depth there. I mean, they have the ability to run a whole mixture of different guys in the first, second, maybe even a third line when you look at some of the depth they have there. I mean, just from the guys that they have coming back from last year, um, they've got Drew Linkaitis, who had that huge game against Georgetown in the NCAA tournament. Cam and Matt Accioni both uh, missed some time throughout last year, but if they're both healthy um, out of the Hill Academy, they had nice uh, freshman years uh, before dealing with some injuries last year. Clay Miller, Nick Jessen will be in the mix there as well. So they're good in the midfield. And then defensively, they have an All-American and, and at the close spot in Owen Grant, who also has some ability to go in transition. I, so I love him as being your number one guy. And Tate Watson, who missed a good portion of last year with injury, was one of the reasons they really excelled down the stretch because he came back. He was able to fill another one of those uh, roles in the close defense. And don't forget, he was a top 40 defender in the country coming out of high school. So he was a pretty highly regarded recruit getting to Delaware has dealt with a bunch of injuries, but if they can keep him healthy, they're going to be in good shape. They return both their goalies uh, that played time a year ago, including the guy, Matt Kilkiri, who was the starter down the stretch. So I love that. And they just feel like last year was a, a nice step, but it feels like they had even the ability to be even better than they were a year ago because of the slow start. So we haven't seen their schedule yet. I'm excited to see what kind of non-conference test they have because I really think that Delaware could be a top 10 team, not only just now in the beginning of the year, but I think throughout the season, a team like we saw Towson a couple of years ago, where in the CAA, they ended up being a uh, top eight seed and getting a home game in the NCAA tournament. Depending on how this season plays out, depending on who's on their schedule, I could see that being a possibility with Delaware, especially coming off what they did a year ago. So Delaware's uh, I've got at number 10. Let's go to number nine. I'm going to go to the Ivy League, a team that was in championship weekend a year ago. That would be Princeton. So there are going to be a couple of Ivy League teams here I have in the mix. And I think in some ways they're similar. In other ways, they're different. For Princeton, I think one of the things that stands out to me and why I have them at nine instead of maybe a little bit further up this list is because they lose Chris Brown. And Brown had a great year for the Tigers a year ago. One of the reasons they made that run to championship weekend they do have Alex Slusher back, but who's going to be that other guy along with Slusher to fill in the mix? I also think you look at what Princeton did a year ago, and I felt like for the Tigers, there's this gigantic chip on their shoulder because the last time we had seen them playing college lacrosse was the 2020 season when they are having this incredible start. They've got Michael Sowers, and every, they're the talk of college lacrosse. Well, the season stops, Michael Sowers leaves, and then it felt like everybody kind of forgot about Princeton. Well, they still had a great team, and they showed it a year ago. Well, now that you've shown it, can you do it again and now plug in some new pieces? They do lose Andrew Song in the back end, who was a great LSM for them. So they, they're losing more pieces than some of these other teams in the Ivy League. That's why I have them at nine. I do think I, I really like Sam English, by the way, in the midfield. They will have to figure out their goalie position with Eric Peters. So I still think a great team, team that's going to compete for being one of the top four teams in the Ivy, going to be in that NCAA tournament mix again. I just don't know if they're quite as good as some of their counterparts in the league, which brings me to one of those counterparts in the league at number eight. Speaking of Sam Hanley, who we're going to talk to here in a little bit, the Quakers of Penn, a team that once again, for the second consecutive year in which they played the entire season, a game away from championship weekend. Remember, it was 2019. They lost the, the heartbreaker in the quarterfinals to Yale. And then this past year, they, they came up just short in the quarterfinals as well. But they have their top six scores returning. This is what gives them the edge over a Princeton team that I think is obviously was very good last year. But this Penn team brings back their top six scores, including Hanley and Dylan Gergar. They've got B.J. Farrar at long stick midfielder. He's one of the best in the country at that position. They do have to figure out the goalie position, but of everything, like I've, with what Penn has done in terms of continuing to refuel talent, I, I think they're going to be okay there. And I just, you look at what the culture has been with this Penn Quakers program. Before the last couple of years here where they've made these quarterfinal runs, the, the culture was, okay, well, they're getting some talent. 
They're competing against good teams in the non-conference. I mean, their non-conference schedule is one of the best in the country almost every year. They're competing against those teams, but they're not quite winning those games. They're coming close. Well, finally, here in the last couple of years, not only are they competing, they're winning, and they're winning consistently. And I think that change of, I don't know if you could, and maybe culture is not the best word for it, but change of perspective and, and change of attitude around some of these games, not only are they just playing to compete, they're playing to win, and they're playing to win deep into and play deep into May. I, I think that experience for the last couple of years will uh, prove to be maybe a little chip on their shoulder because I, I think in the same way we talk about Princeton and what they felt like they still had to prove, I, I do feel like in – talking to Sam and kind of getting a feel for this Quakers program, I do feel like they're like, all right, we've been to the quarterfinals now, back-to-back full seasons for us. But, like, let's prove to everybody we're Final Four good. Because, quite frankly, they've been Final Four good the last couple of years they've played. They've just missed out. So I, I think that going to propel them uh, to be in that, in that mix again. I have them here eighth in the preseason. All right, let's go to the ACC for my seventh ranked team here in the fall, uh, here in 2022, entering 2023. We're going to go to the ACC with Notre Dame. Obviously, the Irish, the talk of Selection Sunday, how they somehow got left out. And I, I was looking back through what had happened at the end of the year, and every, and it still feels like it's a head-scratcher that they were left out. And it, a lot of it came down to the fact, I think, them losing the head-to-head to Ohio State just crushed. They win that game. I think they probably get the edge in, and Ohio State may have been left home. There, I mean, there were a couple of little things that could have happened that put them in. It just didn't happen for them early in the year. But they won six straight to finish the year. And that's the team that I think we're going to see here in the spring. Now, they do have some question marks. They've got to replace some stuff on defense, but they've got additions of Chris Fake and Brian Tevlin coming in from Yale as grad transfers. Fake, obviously, I mean, if you've been a fan of college lacrosse, you know his name since his freshman year at Yale as a lockdown defender. I think he slides in nicely to uh, this defensive unit for Notre Dame. Brian Tevlin, a nice addition to the midfield as well. That can help make up for some key losses there. They also have Jack Simmons coming in from UVA. Another guy can add some depth to the midfield. And I'll be really interested to see how Chris Conlon, the defenseman from Holy Cross, transfers in. Because Chris Conlon's actually a name you may have heard of coming out of Holy Cross because he's been one of the top cause turnovers guys in the country the last two years. Notre Dame's defense is not known for cause turnovers. So I'll be very intrigued to see how a guy who has been kind of really making his name causing turnovers and throwing some checks at Holy Cross, how he transitions into a Notre Dame defense that traditionally has not been known for throwing a ton of checks and causing turnovers. It's been the lock them down, let's, let's play solid and, and make you beat us without throwing stuff. I'll be interested to see how he slides in there, but I think he can be another good addition on the back end. The Jake Taylor injury is certainly a question mark, uh, as it was reported here in the summer, that he had another knee issue. He may be back some point in the middle of this 2023 season. He was a key for them down the stretch, so keep an eye on that. But I think Pat and Chris Cavanaugh feel like they probably have something to prove there at the attack spot. And uh, I really like Liam Entman in goal. He helped Team USA win a gold medal this summer in the U21 World Championship. So they've got pieces back. They've got some key grad transfers that are additions. And you can't underestimate what not being in the tournament last year means to this group. Anybody who was part of that team last year, you know that they are not going to leave any stone left unturned to make sure it doesn't happen this time around. I also just can't imagine the ACC having the year in which they did a year ago. So the wins down the stretch and the games down the stretch that Notre Dame is going to play this year against ACC opponents probably should carry more weight than they did a year ago. So I think they're going to be in the mix. I have them here at number seven. We're going to stay in the ACC at number six, another team that just was on the outside looking in at the NCAA tournament last year. That would be Duke. You look at this roster, and I think it's getting overshadowed a bit here in this year because Syracuse, in terms of their recruiting class for 2023, has kind of stolen some of, or 2022 into 2023, this freshman class, has kind of stolen some of the recruiting talk and the thunder there. 
But let's not forget that Duke has had some of the best recruiting class in the country like the last five years. Well, all those pieces now are moving into their sophomore, junior, senior years. So they've got talent through the roof. The question, I, I think, is how do they figure out how to maximize that talent? And I think it's centered around Brendan O'Neill. I, I think we, at times last year, saw glimpses of the Brendan O'Neill as the center of this offense that I think everyone is picturing at some point. I mean, because they've got pieces everywhere, and if you have him doing what he's done throughout in the beginning part of his college career, we saw it internationally with his U21 Team USA team, the guy is incredibly skilled. So them figuring out well, uh, Brennan, along with all the other pieces offensively, and um, Coach Janowski figuring out how do we maximize this to make it work, I think is going to be the key uh, offensively. I mean, there's no shortage of weapons. Along with Brennan, you got Dyson Williams still there. Andrew McAdory, who's entering his sophomore year, is already a Seems like he could be an absolute star. That's what we saw coming out of Long Island. He and, and Brendan O'Neill have been familiar with each other for a while now. Aiden Denenza, another name to make sure you know in the midfield. And they've added uh, a grad transfer in Thomas Schelling from Lehigh. He was an all-Patriot League performer, one of the top scorers for Lehigh the last couple of years. Another good addition, I think, to add a little bit more, and either, even another veteran to this attack unit for some more depth, not that they need it but just an ad added piece to make up for some of the losses that they have uh, of guys who have been fifth and sixth year guys who have left. So it's going to be a slightly different look than no more Joe Robertson in town for some of those last second scores, but I, uh, the talent is there. I think this is a Duke team that is poised very much like Notre Dame. You get left out in your ACC program. That is not what you expect. Like that is not, why you go to Duke. You don't get to go to Duke to be left out of the NCAA tournament. I think we're going to have a uh, nice bounce back year. So I got the Blue Devils here at number six in my poll. So let's get to this top five. At number five, a team that had a breakout season in 2022, main championship weekend, that would be Cornell under um, Connor Busick in his first year. And I mean, the question I have for anybody out there is, does, does Cornell have the best number one offensive player and number one defensive player in the country? Like, I don't know if there's another team that has a duo like they have in Gavin Adler, a first-team All-American defenseman, and C.J. Kirst, who's an All-American attackman. And we saw Kirst uh, play for this Team USA U21 team this summer. I mean, these dudes are for real. They are going to have to figure out some stuff around them but I love this offense. I mean, C.J. Kerr stole a lot of the headlines last year. But Michael Long has been doing this since that 2020 season, which was his freshman year on campus. I love him and Kerr being able to work together because Bo Long can be a quarterback from X. Kerr, of course, we've seen can finish and he can handle. That is a great duo to have at your attack spot. I, I love the versatility that gives Busick and not allowing a defense to just block off or isolate and try to take one of those guys away because you've got another guy that can beat you. I, I think that's, that is really key for both to be able to excel. So I, I love that uh, for their offense. You got Chase Erland, of course, back in goal as well. And I, I think having a veteran goalie is always an important thing uh, to, to go on a run. So all of those reasons why I have Cornell, a team that with, came as close as anybody beat Maryland last year. There weren't many teams that came close to being that, beating that Terps team. They were one of them a couple of goals away in that championship game. I, I think they're back in the mix this year. I don't know if maybe not quite Final Four again unless some good things break their way, but they're right there in the mix. The class, though, I think of the Ivy League is a team that did not make the Final Four last year. But I think we'll be there again, and that's Yale. They're my number four team here in coming out of the fall. They were a really young team, and I, I don't know if I really realized it last year at the time, but they were a pretty young team last year. And outside of Matt Brandau, Brandau on offense, they had a lot of new pieces to try to figure out. Well, they started to figure it out. It was that BU game where they hung, it felt like a gazillion goals against the Terriers and it matchup of at the time unbeaten teams I think that started to get the train rolling and I think the confidence is only going to expand I, I love Brandau at the attack spot along with Leo Johnson and Thomas Bragg there I mean Matt Brandau the fact that he wasn't a Torton finalist last year I think 
is shocking. I would be absolutely shocked if he's not a top five player this year. He may be walk into the uh, into the year as a tour time favorite. I mean, I think him, Sam Hanley, maybe a, a guy like CJ Kirst, like those are the guys that I, I think you have to have in the mix uh, in the tour time conversation this year. So he, he's going to lead the way. They do lose uh, fake and Tavlin, as we, as we mentioned, have, have gone to Notre Dame, but their defense still returns a bunch. Michael Alexander is a great uh, defenseman Jared Paquette back in the back end uh, at goal. So I, I think all that youth got a lot of time last year. They, they were guys that had come to campus and they were supposed to be part of the team in 2021. They obviously didn't play. So you had a large group of guys who had this Yale team has been recruiting like crazy. So you had a large group of talented guys that hadn't really seen the college lacrosse field. They got that exposure last year. They experienced. I think they build on that. I think they, to me, are my pick early on in the Ivy. Despite all these teams returning a lot, I really, really like this team. I, I like the upside for the Bulldogs. Don't be surprised if it's maybe a little tough at, at the start. They're still trying to figure it out, but I, I think they're going to figure it out pretty quickly uh, this year. All right, number three. Team that lost, surprisingly, to Delaware in the first round of the NCAA tournament last year, Georgetown. Nobody reloads through the transfer portal quite like Georgetown. I mean, this grad transfer list is unbelievable. First, you had Tucker Dordovic out of Syracuse, All-American midfielder or attackman, wherever you want to slot him. Nikki Solomon and Jacob Kelly come in. You add them to Will Bowen, who was there last year, obviously, as a transfer. He stays. He's still there defensively. And then you got the guys that have been there. Graham Bundy is one of the best midfielders in the country. An an unbelievable size and athleticism for him. Matchup nightmare for anybody. Kind of similar to Sam Hanley, who was the midfielder in the country, best midfielder in the country last year. So similarities there. Love Declan McDermott and TJ Haley, as well as returners. And once again, it's Georgetown who I, I think for most of the season, it felt like they had proven, hey, you know what? This isn't the same old Georgetown team. We're not going to fade away. We are a team that should be considered for championship weekend. And then they fell short in the playoffs. So chip on their shoulder, feeling like they have something to prove. I think they prove it this year. They're my number three team coming out of this fall. Then we get to my top two. So we got two teams here in the picture. And the defending champs I have at number two. It feels weird because it, this Maryland team a year ago was one of the best champions, an all-time great champion, maybe one of the, maybe the best champion we have ever seen in college lacrosse. I, I mean, they are in that conversation with 1990 Syracuse and some of the other great teams we've seen in college lacrosse history who are undefeated national champs. However, they lose... A ton. Let's talk about what this team lost. They lost the Tawarton winner in Logan Wisnowskis. Um, they lose Eric Maliver, who was supposed to be their top returning scorer. He's out for the year with an injury. They lose um, basically their entire stable of starting short stick defensive midfielders. They do return some pieces offensively in Kyle Long and Owen Murphy. And they do return strength defensively in Brett Maycar Alex Zapatello, Golan Logan McNaney is back. But there's the questions at short stick. They have a new offensive coordinator. Bobby Benson has moved on. He's now the head coach at Providence. There's going to be a new feel, and I think it's going to be a maybe more throwback feel at Maryland. This is not going to be the Maryland team we saw last year that was scoring 16, 17, 18 goals a game. This is going to be the Maryland team you were used to where they're winning games 9-5. to five. 10 to 6. I, I think it's going to be a struggle for other teams to get to double digits, but I think at times this offense is going to have to feel some stuff out. They don't have, it doesn't feel like they have that guy like we've seen from Bernhardt or Wisnowskis in the last couple of years, who was that number one, the dominant attackman. I don't know if they have that guy on this team. So the question marks there are why I don't have them number one. I still think they're going to be great. And if you bet against John Tillman, m- More often than not, you're going to be wrong. So I'm not going to bet against John Tillman because this guy has reloaded time and time and time again, and they almost always find themselves back in championship weekend. So I'm not going to doubt them. But because of all their losses, I just don't know if I can put them in number one now in the fall. They may quickly change that, and I'll see them here in the spring and go, 
You know what? Actually, no, they are still that good. They should be the number one team in the country, but I'm going to put them at number two for right now. Which brings me to number one. It's the team that Maryland ended their season last year. That would be Virginia. And the difference here is they bring back what feels like just about everybody. I mean, they do have the number one, their number one guy, their number one option coming back in Connor Schellenberger, who I think is going to be a towards on favorite this year. You add in the number two, two overall recruit in the country in Truett Sunderland. Griffin Schutz is back. This offense feels like it just has, in similar ways to when I mean, you talk about some of the names with Duke, like you just go through the offensive firepower with Virginia and it just feels like it goes on and on and on with guys you feel like at any given time could go off for two or three goals in a game. Virginia's depth offensively is really, really impressive. They bring back 80% of their scoring from last year. Really the only piece they lose is a big piece in Matt Moore, but that's about it offensively. Then defensively, they bring back everybody at close defense. You got Cole Kastner, Kate Sawstead, Quint Matsui, all back at close. They all have continued to grow together. I mean, you look at a couple of years ago, coming off that championship year, uh, Matsui, Kastner, like walking in, starting as freshmen and sophomores. Well, now they've got years of experience. They've grown together. I, I think this defense, which is at times proven to be just so tall, long, and athletic, is only going to get better because of the continuity they have at that end. Matthew Noon's back in goal. He was starting as a freshman last year. I have a feeling like he's going to be better here in his second year as a starter. And on top of all that, we mentioned Sutherland, number two overall recruit, who it sounds like is going to run out of the midfield despite coming in as an attackman, but they're going to find a way to get him on the field. I love that. And you add in Thomas uh, McConvey, the number one overall pick in the NLL draft, who was a terrific goal scorer at Vermont. He transfers in as a, as a uh, grad transfer, and I think he's going to be just a perfect addition to be able to add some more firepower offensively. So Virginia, like when you think about your number one team in the country going into a season, you don't want to have as many question marks. You, you have to think, all right, what teams have question marks? What teams like, do I feel like I have answers to all the questions? Well, to Virginia, with what they have, when I look at the roster, it feels like they have answers to all those questions. And I don't know if I have the answers to the questions yet for Maryland. So that's why I have Virginia there. The question is, that how does Virginia shake off some really ugly performances against Maryland last year? That, that was really the difference in Virginia's season. They had some ups and downs, but for the most part, they were consistently a pretty great team last year. With the exception of the couple times they played Maryland, including in the quarterfinals of the NCAA tournament. So if that's your only question for Virginia and Maryland lost a bunch of the guys that crushed them, I'm feeling pretty good. So Virginia is my very early number one team coming out of the fall. Speaking of one of the players on these teams, you talked about Penn. Sam Hanley returning for the Quakers, getting ready for one last go there in Philadelphia. I had a chance to catch up with him earlier today. This segment of Lacrosse Now is brought to you by Watch Dingo. So Sam Hanley getting ready for this spring for at Penn joins us now. Sam, thanks so much for taking some time. Uh, I, I see you're out in Oregon. Talk to tell the people what you've been up to here this fall. Well, I've been lucky enough uh, to be training with Team USA. So it's obviously a long haul back to Maryland from Oregon. <laughs> uh, I've been trying to grow the game as much as I can out here and use my, you know, kind of sphere of influence to just get people excited about lacrosse in Oregon and then kind of doing some, uh, some Oregon stuff, selling granola bars on the side. <laughs> what kind of, what kind of granola bars are we selling? Better for you kind bars. Wow. All right. Nice. It, it, are, that's that like what, what flavors are we talking about? What, what's in them? What, what, do you, what do we got? Yeah. So it's all still in the works with all like the FDA compliance stuff, but, um, you know, the goal is one day to be on like the shelves at your local supermarket, kind of like a clean, simple ingredient list. That's I, I like it. We'll have to we'll have to get a, a try of some of these some some entrepreneurial stuff you got going on here in this fall away. What's it been like? I mean, because I'm sure you, you miss being with the team back on campus for this fall. What's it been like being away from that? Yeah, Um you know, obviously, I wish I was around my friends all the time. But for me, you know, this is my fifth year ish quasi, you know, with all the Ivy League, everything. And it's been really good for me just to take a step back, um, kind of 
figure out more of who I am as like a leader team. You know, last year was only my second year playing and without real game experience in those two years, it was kind of like a sophomore season and you just don't know what you don't know when you haven't played um, for as long as we didn't. Um, but I, you know, I feel a lot more confident kind of my leadership ability and just kind of where I fit on the team in general. What kind of chip is on the team's shoulder now, knowing like the last two times you guys have played a full season, it's been right there on the verge of whatever, where everyone wants to get to in championship weekend. Well, how, how does that motivate a team that's got in with you guys that has so much coming back? Yeah. You know, I think it's more like I mentioned a little, a little bit before it's more, don't think just do. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily a chip, more of a hunger. Um, just to keep working hard and getting 1% better every day. What is that feeling of coming so close now in, in back-to-back full seasons? Like, how do, you, how do you look at what you guys have accomplished in those two years? You know, I think, you know, I, I, I've been saying this before, but as we, I think, you know, the Ivy League kind of do- winning the Ivy League always seemed achievable. And the postseason was always just extra credit, extra fun. And, um, you know, as now that we're like a nationally ranked team and have proved that we can really play with anyone out there, um, the focus is different for the first time in my career, at least where I sit. No, it makes sense because like it's like, all right, well, you know, you got to take it in baby steps. Like first, we got to find a way to finish in the top four in the Ivy League, which even now is really hard for anybody in that conference. And then you want to win it. And then after that, it's like, all right, you got to go through the steps. Well, you've gone through some of the steps. Now it's like thinking big picture. Yeah, that's right. Um, You know, I think for me personally, you know, coming in as a really low ranked recruit, I just um, never thought I'd be in this position, um, you know, when I left high school. So, you know, I just all of it, I'm just lucky to be a part of. I mean, it, let's hit on that because this past year, you're the top midfielder in the country. You're the Ivy League Player of the Year. How surreal is it to get that kind of recognition? And, and you, you mentioned it, like really only your second year of college lacrosse. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. Um, like I said, I'd never thought I'd be here. You know, I came into college just hoping that I would play one day, and um, yeah, just. Credit goes to my teammates, coaches, for putting me in a great spot to be successful. Yeah, I mean, it clicked in your freshman year, and we've just watched this incredible, um, you know, like emergence of where your game's been. What are those things where you feel like you've improved since the time you stepped on campus freshman year? Like, what are those things that you've gotten better at? I think um, you kind of, I kind of felt it and saw it towards the end of the season, but just like having fun playing lacrosse, you know, celebrating hard after goals. It wasn't something that I used to do very often because I always, um, you know, I always thought, I always thought, you know, I'm a perfectionist. Like, I just want to do it the right way. And if, you know, I was supposed to do it this way, but, you know, any college lacrosse career is short and just taking advantage and really enjoying um, the time spent is something that I've been trying to focus on more. What did you learn about being a captain last year? It's tough. You know, a a team is a complex organism. Everyone has, um, you know, their own way of learning and existing and being and kind of figuring that out, figuring out where your teammates lies. um, Not only fun, but also hard too. I have to imagine it's got to be pretty cool to know when you get back with this team, you've got so much coming back, especially in offense. I think it's what your top six scorers are back. What's the continuity like with that group? And obviously there'll be some new pieces that emerge and some guys that fill in. But what's the continuity continuity feel like when you know you've got so much returning from a, a great team last year? Feels great. I mean, um, it'll be interesting because so it's me, Piper Bond. Dylan Gergar and BJ Farrar, who are all in this, you know, um, semester off. But from what I've heard and what I've seen when I've been back is that um, our captains right now, Matt Plazzi, James Shipley, have been doing a great job leading the team. And um, everyone's just hungry and constantly working. Speaking of working, you mentioned USA Lacrosse. You've had an opportunity to uh, continue to compete, trying to make this 2023 World Championships roster for uh, this summer uh, out in San Diego. What's that experience been like? 
it's been really surreal. I mean, these are the best 50 players, you know, in the world. And just uh, the opportunity to step on the same field and um, as those guys has been nothing short of incredible for me. What, what was the, like, welcome to Team USA moment? Um, I think it was probably going up against Michael Earhart, you know, who's a guy who's my size. And, you know, usually I can, like, put a shoulder in and have, like, you know, make him go back a little bit, but um, not with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you're used to being so much bigger than everybody else in the lacrosse field. Every once in a while, you run into somebody your own size. Yeah, yes. Um, I, I've seen the clip from, uh, I forget, I, maybe it might, might have been this fall classic tryout period where uh, you dodged and you, I think you find Michael Sowers there. What's it like to have Sowers on your side of things as opposed to those Penn-Princeton battles? It's good. It's good. I mean, everyone out there is super talented and someone who, you know, I'd been following for a long time before I stepped out. So I think obviously it's pretty cool to have Michael out there, but it's just it's pretty awesome to be um, there with everyone, too. What what have you learned from those tryout weekends? They're tough. I mean, everyone's trying to make this team and um, the international game and rules are way different than lacrosse, you know, college across. So. Again, it just comes back to don't think, just do. Um, you know, take chances, but don't do not do anything that you wouldn't do normally, I think has kind of been a message for myself. You mentioned, like, coming out of high school, just trying to uh, make a, a college lacrosse roster and trying to, like, make your mark somehow, some way. Well, now you find yourself a couple years later and you are one of the best players in the country entering your final season. Like, where where do you want to see your game go? Like, I'm sure, obviously, you want to be part of Team USA. Like, do you want to try to play pro, pro lacrosse? Like, wh where do you see yourself going in, in lacrosse? Yeah, 100%. Well, I'm definitely, you know, if I'm lucky enough to get drafted, I'm, I would definitely enjoy um, being in the PLL. And um, I'd worked it out with my job ahead of time that they're um, going to be nice enough to let me do that. And, yeah, you know. Um, if it, if it, I'll make team USA this time, I think I probably have one more tryout process in me. Um, obviously like to make USA team USA is kind of the pinnacle of our sport and to have that honor forever is, um, would be, you know, amazing. And like coming out of high school, could you imagine that like these would have been on the, the table like five years later? No, never, <laughs> never really crossed my mind. It was always just, I just wanted to play. Not even in your wildest dreams? You know, it was maybe, oh, maybe maybe I'll make the MLL for a year just to say that I was a pro athlete. But um, no, definitely not the position that I'm in today. Well, uh, Sam, it's been awesome to, to watch this uh, rise of yours throughout your college career. Can't wait to see you this spring. Uh, we'll catch up sometime here soon, but uh, good luck as you get ready here for 2023. Thank you. I appreciate it. Big thanks to Sam Hanley for taking some time uh, from his time out there in Oregon. Cool to see him have an opportunity to do some different stuff here in the fall before he returns to campus for Penn for his final go with the Quakers. Well, uh, every Wednesday, as we've been talking about here on LSN, uh, we've been throwing a watch party starting at 8 a.m. and then again at 6 p.m. Eastern time. We watch some of the best games that we've aired here on the network over the last five or six years. A couple of weeks ago, we had a chance to do the Drexel Dragons. They had uh, a couple of really memorable games here in the last couple of seasons, including a big CAA semifinal upset over then top-seeded UMass back in 2019. That was a memorable game for goalie Ross Blumenthal. We had a chance to catch up with Ross and have him tell some stories about some of those memorable games earlier in the month. So one of the stars from that CAA semifinal win for Drexel, goalie Ross Blumenthal joins us now. Ross, man, uh, we just watched that 2019 upset over UMass to the semifinals, the CAA tournament. I can't get over the save you made there at the end of the third quarter. Uh, what do you remember about that game? Um, man, that was that was a tough game. I The first thing I remember is I got a terrible night's sleep the night before. I was up all night. Like, I don't know how, like, nervous as i've ever been i'm a freshman first playoff game like warm-up was awful before the game like getting shredded luckily like i started out the game and like i made a save like they had like an alley dodge and i kind of settled down a little bit and you know that year our offense was really good so whenever we needed to play like marshall king and 
Reed Bowering and Matt Varian, like they would come in clutch and which was great for me being a nervous little freshman goalie. And I mean, at the end of that third quarter, um, I don't know, we turned the ball over and I always kind of like those, those breakaway type of things where it's like one on nothing. I mean, obviously like you don't want that, but as a goalie, like all the pressures on them. So it's kind of just like, if they miss, man, that really sucks for you. But if like I get scored on, like, I'm not supposed to make that save. It's literally one on zero. Like he has so much pressure. He's thinking about that shot as he's running down the field. Like he, and he obviously like got really scared because he just tried to dunk it on top of me and I'm guessing high. So like he kind of just threw it right in my stick and it made it look really cool. And I was very excited because I mean, the team really wanted to win. We were feeling good. We knew we could beat that team. We almost beat him early in the year and uh, it all came together. We had a really hot start and, finished strong and it was that was a really really cool game i just remember being so tired before and then like the adrenaline comes and the second the game ended i like could barely walk i just like if it wasn't like a flu game like like michael jordan or something like that but it was like a no sleep like exhausted type of game luckily i'm a goalie so i would have to run around a lot so like, i kind of <laughs> like get some energy that way and just like kind of pace myself a little bit but it was it was a rough game for me mentally, and it, I was very thankful to get that, that save in the third quarter. Yeah, well, and like the momentum, because at, at that point, if I remember correctly, like UMass, it, it felt like it was starting to come back. Like you guys had the lead. It felt like they were starting to come back, and it goes, mm-hmm. all right, here comes the number one seed. And the momentum from that save, and I think it on top of the save, it's your reaction. Like I was talking to Reed Bowering about this. He's like, he just explodes <laughs> like you're fist pumping going back. Like I, th- the bench fed off that, I think as much uh, as the save. Well, that was not, so that UMass crowd is very, at least for me, they're always chirping me from the sideline. Like there were these girls who like had my stats up front and they were like, <laughs> you have a 49% save percentage. Like you're awful. Like ru- everyone in the stadium can hear, hear them. And like, that's something that would, get to me sometimes as a freshman and I was just like yeah I made that save like that was the side that they were on like I feel like I kind of looked at them for a second like and that was that was another thing because I mean it was pretty ruthless like there's some games that happens especially when I was younger and that was something else like we needed that I needed that from my own mental just like I'm not that bad guys. Like, look at me. I'm we're, we're about to beat you guys. Like we, we were feeling good and that was a huge momentum swing. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, talking about it, it's gotta be up there. Where, where does that save rank for you? That's pro. I mean, that's probably the coolest. I don't know. I mean, it would have been nice if we had beaten Notre Dame and like some of those saves at the end of the fourth quarter, like yeah. were those are, those are pretty cool. Um, you know, I had a, big one against Ryan Tierney in the CA championship where we like, I stuffed him on the crease and threw the ball and we got a big goal, like in that, like nine to two run that we had in the first half. I don't know. That's uh, that's definitely a big one. Actually, I would actually say a really underrated one was, I don't think you guys broadcast this game, but we needed to beat Hofstra that year to get into the CA tournament. Um, Both teams like had just been Fairfield, whoever won that game was going into the tournament and we were down like three goals at the end of the third uh, period and Matt Varian like t- takes it all himself, scores a bunch of goals. We're up one with like a minute to go. Uh, they get a fast break with like 20 seconds left and they have like a shot from like eight yards and I save it with like 10 seconds to go. And then we win the game um, against Hofstra. And that's what got us to be able to play in that UMass game. And so that was, I actually probably would say that could that, cause if we lost, that game missed the CA tournament two years in a row. Like Drexel lacrosse might be looking a little differently than it does now. So I honestly want to say that save against Hofstra is probably my biggest save. Yeah, that's, that's a pretty big one. I forgot about that. Uh, you mentioned starting as a freshman, and I, I remember the, the first weekend you started was we had two games of yours, the Philly Ford Lacrosse Classic. You guys are playing St. Joe's and then Villanova. You beat St. Joe's at Villanova on Friday night, and then you guys respond by beating Villanova at your place on Sunday in a big game, it, I mean, you talked about the pressure and like not being able to sleep. Like, what was it that you were able to kind of step in and you just kind of made that job yours kind of early on that year as just a freshman? Yeah, I mean that that weekend was was awesome. That's probably like 
a top weekend like I've had at Drexel just like I mean I I went to a school like I didn't even like went to go to this big high school like I went to a school called Friends School which is in the MIAA but we were in the B conference so like I haven't really played against some of these players and like I never expected to play my freshman year like and I I was feeling really good I, I was doing really well in practice and it was just kind of like an open competition to start that week and I knew that I think the coaches also knew like that was just my chance to kind of prove to them I'm ready. And I did well enough in practice. And man, I mean, that St. Joe's game was tough. I wasn't feel like I, if they had more shots on net, they hit a lot of pipes. Like I think they kind of had me in that game. Luckily, like our defense played amazing and we squeaked that one out. And then the Nova game awful first half. And then I really like stepped it up in the set in the second period and like, I don't know. That was, that was really cool. It was kind of just a vintage, you know, when I old fourth quarter games, my freshman year where I'd start slow and really just become a lot more comfortable. And it was, uh, it was really cool to, to be a part of that. I do think it's a great lesson to like everybody who walks into college. Like you just never know. You just gotta oh, be, yeah. you just gotta be ready for the opportunity try to make the most of it and see what happens. A hundred percent. It was also, also another thing is just like, I got lucky to play my freshman year. A lot of people come in thinking, oh, I'm going to play. And then they kind of pout a little bit and like have a little too high expectations sometimes. And I think that's something really important for me was I was just trying to live in the moment. And like, if I play great, if I don't, well, I got that redshirt year and um, it ended up working out for the best because I was supposed to redshirt that year. So um, who knows if I hadn't played that year, I would have had a six year uh, coming up next year, which would have been cool, but I'm very thankful for that freshman year. That was an experience like uh nothing else yeah and, and some memorable games as as we're going through here the 2019 season obviously then COVID cuts the 2020 season short and then you guys come back and you win the 2021 championship how did kind of like maybe what you did in 2019 feel like maybe it ran over to the team that ended up winning the CAA title in 2021 oh yeah I mean that team most of the guys came back they were there for that COVID year that got canceled I felt like we had it that year for the COVID year I thought we I'm sure every single team like you <laughs> team Yale like I think every team was feeling pretty good about themselves but we had lost a lot of co- close games that 2020 season and there was a lot of guys that came back from that 2019 we had beaten the top seed in the tournament against UMass and we were feeling good we knew we had the pieces with Co- Jimmy Corder coming back you know, Reed, um, Varian was on that 2020 team. And then I think we just, we really were, were putting it all together. The defense really meshed really, really well with Brennan Greenwald and Pat Udovich and Sean Quinn. I mean, he was just, we had that lockdown defender since as long as I've been here. So he, we, that 2019 team, I think really was the start of kind of changing of the culture. And I think it really happened with that UMass game and that Hofstra game that I talked about earlier to get into the tournament. So um, that team is really important. Yeah, for sure. I, the CAA championship game, you, you guys win it at Hofstra. It had been since 2014, since the program had, had won the CAA title. Oh, what were what are your favorite memories from that game? I mean, before the game, like, usually, like, you're obviously really nervous at the CAA championship, but, like, with Delaware losing, like, they played the first game, we played the second semifinal game. With Delaware losing, I was just like, this is like starting to become like meant to be like we're winning and that we're winning this. Like, and then we start slow against UMass in that CA uh, semi game and then have really like the best 60 minutes a team could ever have from the second half of UMass to the first half of Hofstra. It was something like, it was, it was really just amazing to see that team was on a mission that that team was different. Our defense was just amazing we were winning face-offs the offense was scoring like we weren't turning the ball over that that game we I was just excited because I was like this is about to happen like we're not losing this game you could just tell like people were relaxed like it wasn't like super tense in there like we were gonna win that game Hofstra was a really good team and I'm sure that they probably thought the same thing but like that was a team on a mission that and I think uh I think it ended up for the best yeah, it's so funny because sometimes you feel it before and it's right and you're and it's like what happened. It's like, man, this we just this is ours. Other times, like you don't feel it, and sometimes then it becomes right. It's just so it's so yeah. interesting. Sometimes depending on the game, the team, sometimes you have a feel, sometimes you don't. Yeah, I hundred percent agree. It's a crazy thing about sports is like 
sometimes just the ball bounces your way or it doesn't. But I think that team, we didn't want to leave any doubt because we came out something like 9-2 at the end of the first half. And it, it was really, really fun. It was, it was a great to be part of that team. It was the coolest thing to just like all the attention that we started to get. Drexel doesn't always get some of these attention that even some of these other CA schools get, even when we're winning just as much. And it was really, really cool to see some of the attention that we got during that season. Yeah, what's the moment like when the clock hits zero and everybody's rushing towards you at, as the goalie and you're the CAA champs? Yeah, I mean, that was that was another game where I was getting pretty relentlessly chirped on the sideline in the second <laughs> half. And that was, they were all, they always like stayed to my side and like everyone like knows it and everyone's kind of looking at them too. And like, it was like, yeah, like we finished it off. Like Hofstra made it close. So like, I was just like big sigh of relief. Like, thank goodness we held on thank goodness like it didn't have to come any closer and just made enough saves got to clear the ball Tierney didn't do anything too crazy besides scoring a goal uh on the ground and yeah. scoring behind the net uh, he had to get like four more of those if they need to win so didn't have to end up on sports center too many times and all we needed was the uh was the win and that's what you come here to do at drexel that's the main goal is win a CA championship and we'd come pretty close a lot of the time and finally being able to put the pieces together was, was an experience like, uh, like nothing else. Do, do you have a favorite game since you've been there? I mean, like, obviously that one's cool. Like as winning that with your friends, like as a team ex- achievement, that's like your favorite, the first one that comes to mind. I mean, the other two that I would say is that Villanova game, my first weekend starting, just like everything coming together. That was really when like it all started like, all right, like maybe this kid like belongs a little bit. Like that second that team was like 13th in the country, Villanova. Like they were really, really good with like Connor Kirst. And like it was it was awesome. And it was on Lack Sports Network. So like we had a lot of attention for that one too. And that was cool. And then last year, I mean, for me personally, the LIU game where I had like 20 saves or something and one player of the week, that's like for like just me personally, that game is also like something that will always live up there as, you know, just making save and save and save and save. And that for some reason, like I just kept, they couldn't get it by me for some reason. And it just like, it wasn't anything like I felt extra good like that game and just the way the wind blew and we ended up winning the game and I played really well, so that was a really fun game as well. Well, uh, Ross, we got two or three in this watch party. We kicked things off earlier with that that Villanova game, and and now we're going to show people that uh, that big win uh, for you guys in the CAA championship game from back in 2021. Thanks so much for the time, man. Can't wait to see you back out there this spring. Yeah, really excited. Thank you very much. So remember, watch party every Wednesday here on Lax Sports Network, LaxSN.com. This week, we've got our Fairfield watch party. Current head coach Andrew Baxter, their former head, sh- head coach Andy Copeland, as well as former Stags Taylor Stroud and Dylan Beckwith joining us for that watch party, sharing some of their uh, memories of their times with the Stags over the last several years. So 8 a.m., 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Fairfield Watch Party this Wednesday on Lack Sports Network. Uh, by the way, before we go, quick shout out to the Trent University Excalibur, who won the Begataway Cup this past weekend. You saw it on LSN this weekend. If you, you didn't see the final play, check it out on our social media. And uh, you can go to our YouTube page to Sell it to watch the championship game from the Begataway Cup from up north of the border. Uh, the Excalibur, we, we talked to Stephen Stamp about how they became named the Excalibur last week of the podcast. So if you missed that story, head back uh, a week and, and take a listen to that. Stephen Stamp was great, but shout out to them for winning the Begataway Cup. And that's all the time uh, we have for this week, though, here on Lacrosse Now. We'll see you right back here next week. See you.